I want to begin by acknowledging the elephant in the room. And that is, here is some guy who has difficulty pronouncing the word Maori and Pukakoi uh, with an American accent who's lecturing Kiwis on race relations. <laughs> Two monologues don't make a dialogue. I'm not here to lecture. I am here to present information. Culture and environment are very powerful forces. They're like a fish in water. The water surrounds the fish. It influences every movement the fish makes. Yet the fish does not see the water. Culture and our surroundings are like a fly landing on our nose. Sometimes things can be so close to you, you don't see them. Or if you do, they're blurred and distorted. It's as if the moment we're born, we're given a pair of glasses. And if we could take those glasses off, we could see reality. But we can't. And we all have a different tint, a different perspective on our glasses. And that perspective, that tint, is affected by every book we've ever read, every conversation we've ever had, every person we've ever met. <coughs> and over time, you get different groups with different tints on their glasses, different perspectives on the world. <clears throat> What's happened here is, let's fast forward to a few days ago. I was talking to a Maori elder who was interviewed for the book. And she said to me, she said, you know, Robert, ever since that book came out, several times I've walked down the streets of Pukekohe and people have said to me, you're, you're in that book, aren't you? you? You were interviewed, weren't you? And she's like, yes. And they would say something like, how can you talk to that guy? How can you told him those things? And she, she would say, well, because it's true. And they would say things like, no, it's not. It's not true. Those things didn't happen. And she would be like, yeah, they did. And they'd be like, really? And I think that's part of the problem, different perspectives here. What this reminds me of, as an outsider looking down at Pukekohe, it reminds me of something that happened a number of years ago in America, the O.J. Simpson trial. When the verdict was read, you had students who had grown up with other students sitting in the same classrooms. And this was the, look, I'm going to use the word white and black. How dark do you have to be to be black and how light do you have to be light? It's all melanin. But just for simplicity purposes, the white students, that was their reaction. They were stunned that he was found innocent. Here's some of the black students at a university. And then this picture here, to me, tells it all. College campus. These are students that, in some cases, grew up with each other, have taken classes with each other for years. Look at the white students. They were stunned by the verdict. The African-American students were cheering. And I think you have something similar going on here. You have people who, how many people in this community who would be considered Pakia realize that for the longest time, no one who was a hairdresser would do Maori hair? I think some people would be surprised by that, but it happened. Now, I want to read a statement. For all of those who have organized this event, from the library staff and those who have turned up today, make no mistake, the easy thing to do would be to not have this. And especially for the elders, is to not come to this, to relive 
past experiences. But I believe that we're here for a reason. That we're here because we want to better understand what's happened and try to fix it. This is a confronting story. And it can be uncomfortable to hear. I am not here to apportion blame or to make anyone feel uncomfortable. That's not my intention. But I am here to tell the story. Some people see me as labeling them as racist and slandering the memories of their ancestors. Not true. I view those who took part in the segregation as products of their time, from an era when it was taught in schools that there were inferior races, and Europeans were at the top of the evolutionary scale. But we now know better. For true healing to take place, we must break the taboo, acknowledge what happened, Teach the lessons of history, because this story offers us insight into the Maori condition today. <clears throat> That's what good history does. Good history speaks to the present. Any discussion of the challenges faced by Maori today must include an understanding of where we have come from. And that is part of the story. Next year, the new Maori-centered curriculum will come in. And every school in this country will have to address the issues that we are addressing today. Our children need to know that there's no such thing as a Maori race, or a Pakia race, or a European race. There's only the human race. Yes, there is a Maori culture and ethnicity. In fact, there are many. Just as there are many Asian, European, African, and Islander cultures and ethnicities. But genetically, everyone in this room is 99% identical. Think of it as a book. And every page or two has a letter or two that has been changed. That's how similar we are. Race is a myth. This truth needs to be taught in our schools along with our history of racism. Every country has a racist past, including New Zealand. From the mistreatment of the early Chinese gold diggers, to the Dalmatians, to the Indians, and to the formation of the White New Zealand League in attempts to deport all Asians, into the dawn raids and beyond. These are powerful stories that teach valuable lessons because while history never repeats itself, it rhymes. Racism only exists because people believe the myth. The solution is not going to happen overnight. It's not going to be revolutionary. The solution needs to be evolutionary. It needs to start in our schools through education. The recent decline of my country, the United States, can be blamed in large part on partisan media and social media peddling false claims. Right now, there are media in South Auckland that are spreading fake news about Maori in the segregation era, and unfounded claims that Celts settled New Zealand before Maori and it's being hidden. Hence, the treaty should be ripped up. I have talked to many educated adults in South Auckland who believe these stories. These claims must be challenged, or you will end up like the United States, where many people still think the election was stolen, that vaccines cause autism, and the wildfires in California were caused by Jewish space lasers. The antidote to fake news in our schools 
The antidote to fake news is our schools teaching critical thinking in uncensored histories that are true to the facts. We owe this to our children so they do not grow up believing myths and fairy tales because they saw it on social media or read it in the Pukekohe e-local. I have also had people tell me that I have no right to tell their story. I believe that no one owns history and that everyone has the right to tell it because this is not a Maori story and it's not a Pakia story, it's a human story. And for the record, I contacted several Maori scholars and asked them if they would write the book with me or recommend someone who could. No one did. I reached out to Pakia historians and sought their help. No one did. So I wrote the book myself. I understand why some Maori didn't want to get involved. I mean, to them, I'm just another Pakia getting their history wrong. And to Pakia, here's some outsider coming into their town who they think is going to call them all racist. This community has been divided for too long. Today is a unique opportunity to rewrite the script for our children and for future generations. But there's a lot of hurt and a lot of pain out there. The answer for me lies in education and in our schools. And it cannot happen until non maori listen to the voices of their Maori brothers and sisters who have experienced discrimination. It is not hyped. It happened. It still happens, and it evokes anger and frustration and pain. There is a sadness and a bitterness out there, and no amount of saying sorry will ever bring back the hundreds of infants and children who died during the segregation era. And make no mistake, they died because of neglect. That's exactly what happened. Because one group was considered a lesser people. I urge the Maori community to summon the courage to move forward, to keep the story alive and teach it for future generations because we owe it to the memories of the infants and children who never grew up, who never had a chance to fall in love or to raise a family, and many of whom are buried in unmarked graves that houses were built over. What I have learned from listening to the voices of Maori and Pukekohe is that the segregation events are not just part of history. While Maori are no longer barred from the upstairs of the cinema, or denied drinks, or haircuts, or the use of toilets and businesses, discrimination is still happening. It's just taking a different form. I honestly believe that there are a lot of non-Maori, not just in Pukekohe, but around the country, who don't realize it and they need to be educated. Whether it's the segregation, health outcomes, education outcomes, uplifting babies, or issues over land, there needs to be greater awareness and acknowledgement by Pakia of past and present injustices. There needs to be greater acknowledgement from our politicians as well. The one thing that can speed up this process of healing is education. This is why this powerful story needs to be part of the new curriculum next year. The new curriculum talks about space for local stories. If ever there was a case for that, this is it. I would like to see Maori and Pakia students from Pukekohe and around the region go out and interview their relatives and write down stories from their families to preserve these accounts for themselves 
and for the community and to raise awareness. We have people in the community and in this room right now who are living treasures, treasure troves of knowledge. Their stories, their voices are far more powerful than anything I could ever say. So in terms of the segregation, <coughs> this is what we're looking at here. Two groups with different perspectives. One group on the Mulberry side are still hurt. They know it happens. And on the other side, there's a perspective that it either didn't happen or it's being hyped for some type of political advantage. And as a result, we have a divided community. So the segregation in Pukekohe, based on my research, from 1925 to the early 1960s, most barbers in town would not cut Maori hair. There was one barber who had a special Maori only chair, so people wouldn't catch a disease and not to offend the European customers. At the Strand Theater, most Maori were not allowed up until about October of 1961. And during most of this period, there was one bar in town that was served Maori alcohol, and at one point, women were escorted outside, and they sat in a field, and they brought the alcohol out to them. At another point, they had separate bar lounges for Maori and Pakia. Most taxi drivers wouldn't pick up Maori. Some would. Some catered to Maori. Most did not. The bus from Pukekohe to Auckland and back, if it got full and a European got on, the Maori had to stand. And there were times where they were forced to sit in the back of the bus. At the school, from 1945 to 1952, there were segregated toilets. Now, it was illegal, but it was done. There was no sign. There was a whole monitor. And if you went into the wrong toilet, you got hit with a belt or a strap. Monday through Thursday, for the swimming baths for the school, it was European and Asians who were allowed in. Maori were only allowed in on Friday, <coughs> after which they changed the water. One of the most surprising things to me as I was researching the story was a report from December of 1937. And four different government agencies sent high-ranking officials to go down to Pukekohe and to look for themselves and to see what was going on because they were hearing different stories. And they reported back that there was an unwritten rule in town that you don't rent to Maori, forcing them to live in slum accommodations on the market gardens and run down huts, hovels, converted manure sheds, converted potato sheds, buildings with walls made of stacked up benzene cans, sutured together burlap bags, with no running water, no indoor plumbing. And that resulted in a tremendous death rate for infants and children from diseases such as diphtheria, whooping cough, measles, tuberculosis. They also reported in December of 1937, when they visited the school, while there were many Maori on the rolls, the days they were there, not a single Maori was in attendance. They found most working with their parents in the fields on the market gardens. The police knew about this and looked the other way. The school administrators looked the other way. The growers looked the other way. The third thing they reported and I just simply couldn't believe it, was that in December of 1937, not a single business in town would let Maori use their public toilets. Now, in 1938, a public toilet was uh, constructed near the park 
specifically for Mulry, so, and I'm using the words from the archive now, so they would stop, quote unquote, pestering the businesses in town to use the toilets. And as I'm reading through this, I'm asking myself, why isn't, why didn't I see this in school, or why am I not learning about this? I think people don't realize the extent of what happened. And the extent of what happened <laughs> is typified in 1938. In 1938, in a relatively small town in New Zealand, Pukekohe, with no more than a few hundred Maori living here, 30 Maori died that year. 29 of them were infants and children aged 14 and under. It was the measles epidemic. But there were many other epidemics. And it was because of the housing. 30. We maybe have 100 people here today. 30 people in one community. And this went on. There were years, 8, 10 people dying. When I say people, I'm talking, I only counted age 14 and under. And I asked myself, we tell the story of Gallipoli, we tell Passchendaele, this needs to be up there with those stories, with the Dawn Raids, with Bastion Point, with Ihumatau, with Erebus, and Serafind, and Featherston, and all the other stories that are being taught in our schools today. Now, the other issue here is, and I think sometimes the Pakia side doesn't realize, businesses um, were often making them feel uncomfortable, that they're not welcome there, and if you don't experience it yourself, you don't think it happens. And I think that's part of the reason for the divide. Uh, there's stories with milk bars at one point not allowing Maori inside their shops. I mean, as one person said to me from Pukekohe, they said, you know, the Pakia doesn't go home with me and they don't see how I live. They don't walk into the shop and somebody comes up and says, can I help you? And follows me around because they think I'm going to say something because I'm Maori. They don't see that. And I think it's important that that is realized. There's a woman who went on, she was a, a teacher at the Maori school. She left Pukekohe, she went to Victoria University, she got her PhD, and she was telling the story about, at one point, the hairdresser in town had a little notice, wasn't this so much a sign, but a notice, that said, we don't serve brown skin customers. It's hard to get ahead when banks don't loan you money and stores refuse to give you credit. It's not just Pukekohe, but Pukekohe was the epicenter. Here's a story from the Papakura Hotel. This woman wrote me a handwritten letter not long ago, and she said, I spent my years growing up in Pukekohe. I joined the New Zealand Women's Royal Corps on leave for a few hours, a group of us girls. We were in cities. We went up to the Papakura Hotel. The Army base was at Papakura at the time. Went into the lounge and were sitting there quietly when the manageress came up and said to the other girls who were Maori, I'm sorry, I will have to ask you to leave. We were astounded. I asked why. And she said to me, you can stay, me being whiter than them, but we don't serve Maoris here. I said to her again, why? And she said, if I don't go, I will call the police. And they went. And here's a story from Pukekohe from the same woman, late 40s. Well, in the Army, I met and later married a Maori boy, so now had a Maori surname. Well, visiting Mom one time, I rang the hairdresser I normally went to to get an appointment. When asked my name, I, of course, gave my married name, Mrs. Corinna. Silence on the line. Then was told, sorry, we're full. But I had to go down into Pukekohe, 
So, went into the hairdresser and was greeted quite well. Had got my hair cut. They were not full. I think it was just the name. So, the native school. The only racially segregated public school in the history of the country. There's evidence that even prior to that school, in the earlier school, that there was segregation with uh, Maori in certain <coughs> classrooms. Now here's a picture of the school you see in a lot of books from 1962. Here's a picture that you don't see in books because the Heritage Collection wouldn't give permission to use it, but I talked to the family and they gave me permission to use it. That's this picture here from 1956, the Maurioni School. And that was from the principal of Hakurakura High School, who was doing research in agriculture back in 1956. He took that photo, Donald Trevor Hunt. And I thank the Hunt family for allowing me to show that. But for me, when I look at that, what picture does that tell me about what I should aspire to be? In 1953, the Reverend Des Jones was in Pukekohe, and Maori parents were, when the school came in, were told, no, you must go to the Maori only school. Legally, they may not have had a case. But here is a good example, and the only one that I'm aware of where somebody overcame this. When the mother of a new Maori family took her children to enroll, this is according to the Reverend, she was told to go to the Maori school where her children could be enrolled. She insisted to be enrolled in the non-Maori school. Again, the response was, sorry, you will have to take them to the Maori school. After ringing the education minister without success, she contacted the Franklin Member of Parliament, Jack Massey, who told her the Maori school will meet the needs of her family more adequately. The woman refused to take no for an answer and eventually got her children into the non-Maori school. Now, I'm not saying the Maori-only school was a bad thing, but what I'm saying is I think it would have been better if we had a combined school. So people keep asking me, how come the Maori didn't stand up? Almost to the point where it's like, well, it's their fault. How come they're not standing up for their own rights? How come they're not protesting? How come they're not filing police reports? In about 1950, there was a woman who I interviewed for the book. This is a similar picture. It's not the same one. But they took a picture for the paper. And they posed in front of their run-down building. And when the owner found out and saw it in the paper, he told them that that was unacceptable and he kicked them out of the house. And that was the, the thing that was held over them. If you complained, you could lose your accommodation that you were paying rent for as well. The Strand Theater. Maury were not allowed upstairs. Now, earlier in the talk, I said until 1961. It was actually October of 1962. Um, when they stopped segregating the Strand. Back in 1933, there was an Indian gentleman, Motorum Wallop, and he sat downstairs in the Strand, or an area that was separated off, and he sat there, there was no reserve sign, and Mr. Blennerhassett came over, the owner of the theater, he told me he'd have to leave and, uh, and, and go on the other side, and he said, why? And he goes, oh, it's reserved. And he said, well, I don't see a sign, I'm staying. And so he went and he got a friend of his who was a fireman, and they tried to pull him out of the chair. And he refused to go. And there were some Pakia people in the theater who were urging him to stay seated in the chair. And often you don't hear that in, in history. Um, anyway, he ended up going to court, and he won his case. The interesting thing, I thought, was there's a number of newspaper articles from 1933 uh, on this case. Assault in a theater. Here's another perspective. Technical assault. He was technically assaulted. That kind of waters it down a little bit. 
I found hundreds of examples of segregation across the country in housing, rental accommodation, hotels and motels, and in employment. Here are just a few. In Hamilton, there was, around 1960, a Hawaiian student that came over here, and he looked Maori, and they refused to let him try on pants at a store in Hamilton. In fact, there were several stores that wouldn't let Maori try on pants at that time, so he complained. On K Road in Auckland, there were signs, no credit for Maori. Councils jacked up prices for state houses to keep Maori out of so-called white neighborhoods. Most banks and shops had official policies of not hiring coloreds until the early 1960s. That's the term that was used, especially at the front desk. The interesting thing is BNZ Bank had a, a big issue in 1955 where Maori Affairs went and talked to them because at the bank they weren't letting this Maori gentleman, uh, they didn't want him in the front counter and they didn't want him working at the bank. So they went to the bank and they said, look, you've got to do your bit for the government. You've got to do your bit for the country. But here's the thing. Five years later, Maori Affairs wrote in the archives that they found one of their own government departments had a policy that you don't have Maori at counters. That's true. They didn't have women either. Yeah. <coughs> So these stories, these are just a couple that strike me. A woman, this is a direct quote from the archives. A woman's clothing shop assistant reports that on several occasions she has been asked by Maori girls, do you serve Maoris here, indicative of previous setbacks. I believe that was in, in Auckland. Uh, and another one here, elderly Maori lady has been told in shops, we don't have anything you would want, or our things would be too dear for you. And so that fits a certain stereotype that you can't even look in the shop. Maybe the, there's a perception they're going to steal, or maybe the perception is, oh, you're Maori, um, you're poor, which there was a story last night in Papakura that from a nurse who um, somebody was offering them credit to be able to buy a refrigerator when they had the cash on them, and uh, she found that uh, disturbing. Um, so this is 1960 from the government welfare officer in Pukekohe. There are no Maoris in banks, insurance or accountancy, and other commercial firms in Pukekohe, Waiuku, Tuoko, Papakura, and Mercer districts. People say to me, or have said to me, well, it's not really as bad as you're making it out to be. Since the mid-1930s to about 1980, engineering students at Auckland University would dress up during their capping day graduation ceremonies and make fun of Maori. And this is an example from 1955 in the city. And when my book came out and that picture appeared, somebody posted a response on Facebook and they said, you know, that was just a small group of jokers from the engineering department at Auckland Uni. Nobody ever took them seriously. We had respect for, for Maori culture at the time. <laughs> Queen Street, 1967. Now there must be thousands of these pictures floating around. <clears throat> Otahuhu in 1969. And they would stop along the way and do a mock haka. And then they'd go on to the next area. Uh, often partly intoxicated. And this didn't stop until 1979, when they had the famous haka party incident at Auckland University. These were some students who were practicing for the Capping Day ceremonies, dressed up and making fun of Maori culture. And Maori were confronting it. They were so frustrated and angry that a few punches were thrown. And in the paper, they were describing them as gang members. Um, and the people that got arrested were the Maori. None of the European students got arrested. 
Southland Times, on that incident, the light-hearted antics of a group of Auckland University students should not be interpreted as ridiculing the culture of the Maori people. That was 1979. That was the common attitude then at the premier university in this country. And 10 years prior to that, for every single year, they wrote to the engineering department and they asked them, and they said, look, this is very offensive to us. Please don't do this. And every single year, they did it. Oh, you're being too, you're being too sensitive. It would be the equivalent for me of seeing someone parade down the street dressed in a Holocaust outfit or something, a prisoner. It's very frustrating. Back then, people would dress up on capping day and they, there were different outfits. According to the Auckland Library Services, this is a French clown. I never would have known that. People also dressed in blackface. Uh, the person here is actually a male and they have blackface on and they're carrying a gollywog down. And of course, gollywog dolls are part of that tradition of blackface and the minstrel shows where white people put black on their face and basically made fun of African Americans. 1923 in Auckland. Those are students from Auckland University dressed up as KKK members. Do I think they're in the KKK? I don't know. But what I do know is this. The KKK was responsible for the deaths of thousands of people, including children. And to do that shows you the degree of insensitivity to other cultural backgrounds. And of course, this is New Zealand television, 1963, and in 1970, still doing blackface. Now, somebody wrote me when the first book came out, they said, they wrote a letter to the editor of the Howard Times, and they said, oh, in Pukekohe, you're exaggerating, I lived in that area, and uh, they always serve Maori in bars. Well, I put that in the cover of the second book. No natives served in this bar. That's the King's Arms Hotel, 1952. And there are many specific examples in Pukekohe where, in the archives, in the files, where they didn't serve Maori alcohol here as well. Now, the Henry Bennett affair was a watershed moment. It happened in 1959. The first Maori psychiatrist in New Zealand, he walked into the bar with his European wife, and they ordered a drink, and they said, sorry, we don't serve Maori here. And as a result of that, there was just an outpouring of letters across the country. On the one hand, there was shock and disbelief by some non-Maori. Many Maori were writing, it's like, yeah, this has been going on. You don't know that? And I think this is part of that divide, where we need to educate and raise the awareness of what's been going on and the extent of the discrimination. One of the people downplaying it, it's exaggerated, it's trivial. The editor of the Gisborne Herald. He was saying that the reason they did that was because there were dirty or noisy Maoris, and it later became a, a racial issue. And these people, it is alleged, live in slum huts and have little idea of cleanliness. Yeah, because they're in slum huts. It's not their choosing to be in the slum huts. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Those were the attitudes back then. There was a woman that was saying, this is across New Zealand now, on a motoring trip across the North Island. In the late 50s, she encountered many hotels where Maori were not admitted either to drink, dine, or stay overnight. And then the Prime Minister weighed in. And he said that Maori and European in New Zealand are New Zealanders. And as such, 
are treated before the law exactly the same way. And I feel that way. I look out here today, and in a way, I don't see Pacquiao or Maori, I see people. And hopefully, you want to hold on to your culture, but we also need to hold on to our humanity. Um, so, at the bar, this blows up, the Prime Minister weighs in on it, and then the licensee of the bar comes out and he says, Oh, Dr. Bennett is welcome at the hotel at any time. And um, he assured him that he was unaware that this was going on. Here's the European Kiwi, he said, Well, visiting the same Papakura Hotel with her Maori husband four years earlier, they were told, Maoris are not served here. This is something that stuck out to me. Now this really started in about 1925. 1944, New Zealand Herald. The reporter observed one grower had 15 families, totaling 50 people, working for him, and most of them lived in old manure sheds. Another family consisting of 12 people were crammed into a two-room shack. Another Maori man told those gathered that a few years ago he was allowed to billet his family in a cow shed on the condition he did not disturb the cows during the morning milking. Here are some of the images. These were taken in 1929. But as you go over in time, they didn't change that much for a long time. Just think of that cold day the other day, as the wind is just going through you and it's rainy. You know, it's a funny thing. It kind of haunts me when I look at this photo. There's an image there of a young girl standing there, and I often thought to myself, I wonder what happened to her. I wonder who she is. You know, she's one of the nameless, almost faceless people. But there. <coughs> Auckland Star. Now we're getting at 25, 35, 40. This is 1950. And this stood out to me more than any other thing I read. A Maori woman had just returned from digging potatoes. Her feet were bare and covered with mud. Her clothes were torn and filthy. She was shy about allowing a reporter to see inside the hut, which was little more than a lean-to shack without water, stove, lighting, or toilet facilities. The reporter continued, she lives there with her husband and four children. She used to have eight children, but four of them died in the last few years as a result of malnutrition and tuberculosis. And then, now we get to 1961. This is a nurse who was in Pukekohe named Leslie Smith. Hidden behind a hedge on a back road of Pukekohe Hill, the shack was of corrugated iron and consisted of two small rooms with an opening between them. In one room, an open lean-to fireplace provided the only means for cooking. A sofa and makeshift table were the only furniture. Two beds occupied all of the floor space in the second room. The floor was of dirt. Small holes in the tin roof suggested ineffectual protection from rain and wind. The only facility of any kind was a tap some distance from the shack. A distressed, coughing baby lying on an old sofa. Two small children stood nearby at the door, peering in. 
Their mother stood slumped shoulders and lowered head with an attitude which spoke of long-standing defeat. The family were Valry. 1961. You could change that to 1925. There's not that much difference. And that's a key part of the story. It kept happening over time. So when I came out with No More Real Out, Auckland University were interested in publishing it. And then they said, but look, this, I'm almost using the exact words. It's too much a book of Maori advocacy and voice to teachers and not enough of a real history. So as a result, I said, I'm not letting you edit this book. I'm just going to edit it. And I talked to my daughter over here and she put the website up and we just printed it ourselves. And when I did, my wife wasn't too happy. And um, she got, we printed up 250 copies. And she goes, you're never going to sell those. We sold all 250 copies within six days. Uh, and at this point, we've sold about 1,800 copies of the book. Uh, people have been writing online. They always like to troll you. Oh, he's making money off the book. If you think I'm making money off the book, talk to my wife. And, uh, <laughs> Not long ago, I gave, well, 60 copies to a South Auckland school, five copies to the staff, and five to their library, because they wanted it and they couldn't afford it. I'm here today, I've missed approximately three and a half days of school in the last 10 years teaching in New Zealand. I took a personal day today without pay to come down here, because it's important, and I don't want to be paid for speaking. I don't want to be seen as capitalizing on someone else's hurt or pain. And some of the reaction to the book has been surprising. Uh, people have said it never happened, or it was minor. I could be wrong, but I'm not aware of the county news printing any articles about the book. And certainly the Franklin uh, E-Local. There was a reporter for a local paper who was interested in writing another book with me, who has a Maori background. Then he came back to me and said, look, um, I can't use my real name. I have to use a pseudonym, a fake name, if I'm going to write a book with you, because the paper's worried they're going to lose advertising. And that's that's part of the story here. It's the fear. It's the fear of what's going to happen. And you've got, look, you've got all these myths out there or unsupported stories that, that Maori were not here first, that it was a group of Celts and that the Maori basically came and ate them. That's the story that's been promoted here locally. And how do we counter these things? I think we counter these things through education in our schools, not from getting it off the street, but real histories. And look, I would be more than happy to have anybody here today who is interested in this. This isn't my gig. My, my background is the sociology of the supernatural. It's the sociology and medical sociology of culture-specific mental disorders. That's my background. I'm not a Maori historian, but I can tell you that what I wrote in the book is accurate and true to the files and the people that I talk to. But I would be more than happy to give you all the records that I have collected and have you go on with the story. And I've noticed in the archives at Mangaree and in the archives in Wellington, there are many files that are still sealed from the 20s, from the 30s, from the 40s. I think that through our leaders here, we should be asking the question, why are they sealed? Specifically on Pukekohe and the Franklin region. Why are they sealed? Or if you want to unseal them, maybe you could redact the names. But this is, this is your history. These are your leaders. You have the right to know your history and what happened. So look, I am, I never would have come here 
if I thought that coming here would make things worse. I hope that through education and raising awareness that that's the way through to our future. It's through the schools. It's through educating and I also think through our politicians. Saying sorry isn't enough, but I think it's a start to, to acknowledge that this happened and to, through our schools and through other means, making people out there who may genuinely think that this is all hyped and it's a made up story or something, it's not. It happened, it's real, and it's painful. Like, I'm, I, I didn't live through it, but well, I can tell you this, going through the Pukekohe Maori Death Register, and that's what it was called, they had a special death register for Maori up until 1962. Going through there and seeing the handwritten notes from the coroner, and the amount of information there from Hapu, parents, grandparents, it's unbelievable. And it's just so overwhelming to sit there and look at that document and just try to imagine the suffering that went on. But I think as a community, somehow, we have to go forward, but we can't forget what happened. And it's through education. And if me being here and doing the books has, has helped to nudge that along, uh, we've got the new curriculum coming in. It's a golden opportunity. And again, it's trying not to apportion blame because then people get very defensive. Well, I didn't do it, okay? But it's important to acknowledge that it happened and for people to realize the depth of the suffering and that it's still going on today. Thank you very much.